This morning I'm going to do something a little bit different than I normally do at the service. I'm going to read the scripture first. And what I'm going to read is the parable of the workers in the vineyard that Jesus tells. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and sent them to, into his vineyard. About nine in the morning he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, you also go and work in my vineyard and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. He went out again about noon and about three in the afternoon and did the same thing. About five in the afternoon he went out and found still others standing around. He asked them, why have you been standing here all day long doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they answered. He said to them, you also go and work in my vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last one hired and going on to the first. The workers who were hired about five in the afternoon came and each received a denarius. So when those came who were hired first, they expected to receive more. But each one of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. These who were hired last worked only one hour, they said, and you've made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. But he answered one of them, I'm not being unfair to you, friend. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give to the one who is hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I'm generous? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. Every year they, there comes, every so often there comes a year that changes everything. These are those marvelous, awesome, fantastic years that are called Annus Mirabilis, the year of miracles, the year of, of wonders, the awesome year. And a few weeks ago, we started off with the very first one of those, the year 1666, when Isaac Newton made his great discoveries of the law of gravity and the laws of motion. Today, we're going to bring it a little closer to our time, to 1905. 1905 is another year that's called Annus Mirabilis. Because in this year, the scientist Albert Einstein wrote four scientific papers that changed the way that we think about our world and the universe. They were called his Annus Mirabilis papers. And they included his, his first lifting up of the theory of relativity. In the Annus Mirabilis papers, Einstein opened her eyes to see that the world isn't how we thought it was. That it's way more amazing than all the science that you learned from Isaac Newton. For example, Newton's big discovery of gravity was that gravity is a force where things are attracted to each other and the force pulls them together like the apple to the earth. But Einstein discovered that's not really true. Gravity isn't a force. Gravity is actually a warping of space and time. Another thing that, that Newton had, had uh, talked about is his laws of motion. And for Newton, energy was based on motion. That the more speed and the more size that you had, the greater the energy. It's kind of like in football. The bigger the lineman and the faster he is running to hit you, the more energy your poor body experiences. But Einstein says, surprise? No, that's not really the way it works. Really, energy isn't based on the speed that you're going. Energy equals your mass times the speed of light squared the most famous equation in all of science, E equals mc squared. And since the speed of light, which is that c, is so large, all it takes is a little bit of mass to produce great energy. And that's why we have a nuclear power plant just down the river 
and why there's such a thing as atomic bombs. Because all it takes is a little bit. And there's tremendous energy in those. Einstein upended the world that we thought we knew from Isaac Newton. And perhaps the, the biggest one of all, the most amazing of all of these things, is what Einstein's work says about space and time. In, in Newton's world, time happens the same wherever you are. If you have a, a watch here on Earth and a watch on the moon or a watch on the other side of the universe, they're all running at the same speed. Time passes the same way. Everything is, is uniform that way. But Einstein's works shows that that's not the case. That actually time is relative and that it passes differently in different places, all based on your speed. The faster you're going compared to someone else, the slower time goes for you. And I don't mean it just seems like time goes slower. It actually is slower. Your watch runs slower, your body ages slower, everything is slower. And this leads to one of the, the great injustices of Einstein's theory of relativity. And that is that those who have left us to go south are actually aging slower than we are. You see, we're a spin on a spinning ball. And if you're around the middle, you travel faster in 24 hours than if you're up towards the top where we are. So they're traveling faster. So when they come back in the spring, they will have actually experienced less time than we have. They will actually come back a little bit younger compared to us. And the same way with distance from the center of the earth, the further you are away, of course, that's a bigger circle that you're traveling, so you're going faster. So if you go out to Colorado and go skiing, you'll come back a little bit younger than the rest of us. I think it is a grave injustice in God's laws of the universe, uh, but that's the way it is. And it's so amazing that you might doubt that it's even true, but it is. Of course, even Einstein had trouble believing some of the discover discoveries that he made. It was right there in his work, but he just couldn't accept that it was true. One of those things was quantum entanglement. I won't get into quantum physics. It's way too, too much for any of us to even think about on a Sunday morning. But quantum entanglement says this. If you have two particles that are entangled, and you, you split them and you send one to the other side of the universe or any place, and if you measure the one that you have, instantly when you measure it, the one on the other side of the universe is the opposite. So it's sort of like having two coins and you flip one here and it shows up heads, and instantly as it shows up heads here, the one 100 billion light years away is tails. And Einstein called that spooky action at a distance. He says it just can't be true. It's so strange, it defies everything that we thought we knew. And he spent a lifetime trying to figure out where, where he went wrong in, in those things. But it's true. In fact, the Chinese have even launched a satellite in the last couple of years that have tested and proved quantum communication, basically instantaneous communication across great distances. But Einstein just, just couldn't believe it. He couldn't wrap his head around it. I guess you could say that that Einstein was no Einstein when it came to quantum entanglement. And you know, in our faith life, we sometimes encounter those same kinds of things. We, we experience things that, that are so amazing that we doubt that they could even be true. God has given us this amazing, mind-blowing, marvelous world. And like Einstein, we sometimes just can't accept what we know to be true. But if we do, we can have an Annus Mirabilis like Einstein had. We can have an awesome year. 
For example, Jesus upended the normal way of thinking. And in Acts 15, we have an example of this. Just as, as Einstein just flipped Newton's thoughts on their heads, Jesus caused people to see things in a different way too. In Acts 15, the church is, is having a, a discussion, a conflict over who can be in the church, who belongs in God's people. How do you, and how do you get in there? And there were some that, that were saying, well, the only way you can be a part of God's people, the only way you can be a part of the church is to be a Jew first. And the only way you can be saved is to follow all the Jewish laws. Because that's what they've been teaching for a thousand years. Certain people came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the believers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses... You can't be saved. This brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and debate with them. So Paul and Barnabas were appointed, along with some other believers, to go up to Jerusalem to see the apostles and the elders about this question. And the apostles and elders met to discuss the question. And after much discussion, Peter got up and addressed them. Brothers, you know that some time ago, God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. God, who knows the heart, showed that he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them, just as he did to us. He didn't discriminate between us and them, for he purified their hearts by faith. Now then, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of Gentiles a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors have been able to bear? No. We believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved, just as they are. We believe that it's through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved, just as they are. The old way of looking at things said that if you want to be in the church, you've got to be a Jew first. You've got to get circumcised. And if you want to be saved, well, then you have to be good enough. You have to fulfill the Jewish laws. But God says, surprise? Salvation is the gift of my love. It's not something you can earn. We are saved by grace through faith. And whether you're a Jew or a Gentile, whether you're a good person or whether you're one of the rest of us, we get in by grace, by God's amazing grace. That's what makes the place for us. It's been 2,000 years since, since this realization, but, but sometimes we just can't accept it, do we? We're like Einstein. We, we know it to be true, but we just can't quite accept. We want to go back to the old way of looking at the world where we get to earn our place with God, where we're saved by our own good works, and where we can exclude others because we know they aren't as good as us. And this grace stuff seems unfair. Well, surprise, God is not fair. God is better than fair. Just like in that parable of the workers in the vineyard, those, those first workers, God says, you're going to get a denarius, which is the, the wage that they expect. It's a good wage. But then when, when those who are hired on at the very end also get a denarius, they're upset. They say, it's not fair. We shouldn't all get the same. We've been, we've been with you longer. And you know, sometimes we Christians think that way too. We think, it's unfair that, that God is saving these people by grace. You can imagine somebody who's lived a terrible life and they come to Christ at the, at the very last minute, make a deathbed confession, and it bugs us sometimes. They were rotten all their life. How do they get in? How do they get the same thing that we have? It's not fair. Well, no, it's not. It's better than fair. All of us get all of God's love. All of us get to be with the Lord. And there's a place in, in church for all of us. 
It's not fair. It's better than fair. You see, Jesus always upends things. We think, we think we've got it figured out. In our old way of thinking, like in, in Newton's science, but then along comes Jesus and everything is flipped on their head. Over and over again, we see that in the way that Jesus teaches. A few months ago, we were looking at the first part of chapter 5 with the Beatitudes, of chapter 5 in Matthew, but I want to uh, look at the end of chapter 5 here today in Matthew because Jesus gives all these examples of how he changes the way that we look at things. And sometimes, like Einstein, we, we just can't really grasp it. But if we can, oh, what an awesome year. <clears throat> Verse 38, he says, You've heard it said, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. That's the old way of thinking, right? Somebody hits you, you hit them back. Somebody does you wrong, you get revenge. We've seen what happens in a world when we live that way. But surprise, Jesus says, I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek. Turn the other cheek, he says. And if someone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. See, a Roman soldier could force anybody to carry their stuff for a mile. But he says, don't just do what you have to do. Go the extra mile. Give to one who asks you and do not turn away from one who wants to borrow from you. You've heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But surprise, I tell you, love your enemy and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good. He sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even the pagans do that? Jesus just upends the normal way of thinking. He tells us to love our enemies, to pray for those who persecute us. I mean, that's not normal. At least it's not Isaac Newton kind of world normal. It seems to be something as strange as, as Einstein's theories of relativity. You know, it, you can see it in, in uh, our Facebook uh, and other social media uh, outlets. How many people are living by Jesus' words, love your enemy, pray for those who persecute you? A week or so ago, a friend of mine, pastor, had posted something on social media that, where he was trying to support another, another person. But it got misconstrued. Do you know how that happens in social media? They, they didn't quite understand it, and they thought that he was... Uh, um, was not supportive. And they jumped on him, and by they, I mean other pastors who were his friends. Jumped on him on social media like you can't believe. So that's how the, how the world likes to work. Somebody does you wrong, you do them back even worse. Jesus says, love your enemy. Pray for those who persecute you. It's such a different way of thinking. But I think if we, if we grasp that, if we really grasp that, we can have an awesome year. Finally, in the last verse there, Jesus says, be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now, we have to realize that this is in the context of a paragraph on love. So what he's really calling us to do is to love like God, to love perfectly. And... We can make a lot of excuses, but, but that's what he's calling us to strive for. To strive to love more than just a little bit or the bare minimum, but to love the extra mile. Do you know that every United Methodist pastor that's ordained ever since the time of John Wesley has been asked the same questions? 
And the question, one of the questions is, are you going on to perfection? Are you earnestly striving after perfection in love? The commitment to try to love to the very best of our ability is what we're called to do. Because loving part way is, is, is simply not good enough. Uh, just an okay amount of love is not sufficient. God says love completely. It's like that AT&T commercial where it talks about the, the okay surgeon. Recognize this one? The, the worried person's in the, in the hospital bed and, and says, well, how is, how is this doctor? And, and the nurse says, well, he's okay. And then he comes in the door and he says, guess who got reinstated? Well, not technically, but... And then the tagline, just okay is not okay. And that's what God is telling us. Just okay in love is not enough. It's not okay. I call you to a life. A life so deeply in, in love that you can love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And if we do that, our world will be turned upside down. And we will have an awesome year. The world as Jesus sees it is so amazing, so marvelous, so surprising. It's a place of, of amazing grace, a place beyond fairness, a place where the, loss, the last can be first, the lost can be found, where enemies can be loved, and where perfection and love can be our goal. Many in the world live like Jesus never lived, just like most of us live as if Einstein never lived. We just deal with the with Isaac Newton and his stuff. But the world is so much more wonderful and surprising than many people imagine. And if we, and if we live in this world of Jesus, then we too will have an Annus Mirabilis. Einstein has his, had his in 1905, but we can have ours in 2020. Let's pray. Jesus, you have given us this awesome creation, this world that is so far beyond our minds that boggles us. But there are some things that, that we, can, we can know and understand. Help us to accept them. That you offer us all your grace. That we are yours not because we are so great, but we are yours because you are great. And you have made us brothers and sisters with people that, that we could hardly imagine. But you've made a place for each one of us. Each one of us. God, help us to love one another. Not just our friends and family, but, but love even those that that we dislike or disagree, even those who have hurt us. God, we'd, we confess we don't know how to do that. But we pray that we can perfect us in love and help us to, to see with your, your eyes and have an awesome year.